清大德生平，为此发挥积切众生，请转妙法论教导我们。如何了生脱死离苦得乐，速证无生。为了三个，为归我求，好的 compassion。For the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attend bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize number. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olafudi Samyao Sambutoshe. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Alahadi Sammyao Samputo Xie. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. 师父上人，各位师兄，大家阿弥陀佛。Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shir. Today is Sunday, the thirty-first of July, here in Queensland, Australia. So it's Saturday, the thirtieth of July, back in California. Please adjust your time. Wherever you are around the planet, welcome to our sutra. And、uh, this is the Avatamsaka Sutra's twentieth chapter, chapter twenty. Yemo Gong Zhong Ji Zan Pin praises in a palace of the Suyama heaven, songs in praise, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Is this aspect of praising?、Uh, people don't think that Buddhism has praise, the devotional side, the bhakti. Bhakti Yoga side, but indeed we do, and it's ongoing. It has made it now into the West, into Australia, into Canada, into Latin America, into North America. So, yeah, let's continue with our protocols for getting started. We have a.、Uh, it's I guess taking refuge is a sort of a praise. It's a recognition. Uh, and when we say namo na nanwu namo namaha, there's a praise there because you, what it says is I'm going to return my life. I'm going to find security here in my connection with you.、Uh, to take refuge acknowledges that the entity, the divinity, the spirit, the 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 God, the Buddha. Who you're taking refuge with it says has the strength to protect you. You wouldn't take refuge with a child, for example.、Uh, the child depends on you for for strength and support and pre- pre- protection. So namo namaha. When we say namo amitofo, namo da fang guangfo, huayan jing, namo guanxi impusa, where it is a praise. It's it's acknowledgement of the、uh, strength and.、Uh, The wisdom and the kindness and the capacity that that being has the capacity to gather us in. So yeah, that's what we're doing here with the title of the sutra and the 
assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who gather around it. So by saying that, what my point is to say, uh, just really acknowledging how much devotion is a part of our Han Chuan Fu Jiao, of our northern tradition of, of Mahayana Buddhism. Then we acknowledge country to say that the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation here in this location for tens of thousands of years. Today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land here in Queensland. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share the land with today, with sorrow for the costs of that sharing and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all First Nations peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. Yes, indeed. Um, here we are. Now look at that desktop. My goodness. Taking refuge. When I showed this picture recently in China, uh, some of the younger monks just gasped and they said, Oh, ni kan nama do lao pusa. Look at all the old bodhisattvas, he said. And the old here doesn't mean age, it means venerate, venerated. Look at all the real bodhisattvas. This is two or three generations of eminent monks of the 20th century. Uh, the Master Shenhua is in the center, but to his right is Master Ming Yang, and to his left is Master Zhen Chan, and uh, over here to his right uh, we have Bhikshu Fo Yuan, and just uh, those who know the Sangha of the past, they go through and name them all. You know. But the second generation is in the back row, the monks who are now uh, in their 40s and 50s and in charge of Buddhism in China. So, here's our text today. And I'm going to focus right here. Let me tell you what's going on. We have uh, the Buddha is in a palace in the heavens called the Suyama heaven, the heaven of well-divided time. And in that heaven, um, 
it's located above the sun and the moon. So the sun's light doesn't get there, but the lights come from the bodies of the devas. They have cultivated their virtue and their their inner light so that that's all you need. Uh, wherever they go, it's illuminated. So in this heaven, the Buddha is there. He's been welcomed. He's, he's, he's uh, on his seat waiting to speak the Dharma of what's called the Ten Practices. And the next thing that happened was ten bodhisattvas arrived. And they all have in their name forest, lin, something. There's something lin. So they're led by the leaders, Forest of Merit and Virtue, Kung Do Lin. And he uh, took his seat. He bowed to the Buddha, took a seat, came back out, circumed, circumambulated with incense probably, bowed three times, knelt down, and then sang to the Buddha. Twelve different praises, twelve verses. And we just finished listening to those. Then when he was done, usually it's ten. For some reason, he got two more. It's Twelve. So, uh, Hui Lin, Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva Forest of Wisdom, came next. He's the one we're listening to right now. And he's sharing his heart, what he feels about being in the presence of the Buddha. And each one of these Bodhisattvas says something different and interesting, and they point to a different quality. Uh, the, well, I'm not going to, that, that brings us right up to where we are, and uh, I, I'll let you listen in. Uh, here we go. Rulai wu yu dang Chiu bi bu ke de Bu liao fa zhen shi the Tathagata is beyond compare. You'll never find his equal anywhere. Yet those who fail to grasp the Dharma's truth, to them the Buddha never will appear. Hmm. The Tathagata, the Buddha, is beyond compare. So he doesn't have language to... There's nothing in the world that he can name that will give you a clue to what the Buddha is like. Because you can't compare. Non-pareil. Non-pareil? Is that the way you pronounce that word? non pare in French. Uh, it's There's nothing like him at all. You'll never find his equal anywhere. And... Probably every devotee of every religion, every chela of every guru, right? Every student of every sifu thinks their teacher is the best. Indeed, that is the case. And that's one of the reasons why religions have been a source of conflict worldwide, is uh, this fervent, zealous disciple doesn't want to acknowledge that anybody else's teacher could be the best, or their god. Uh, so they go to war over these claims. Now, is here's Huilin Pusa. He doesn't have to make his case. Um, he's This is a praise. He's, he's among friends. Nobody's going to disagree with him here. But... Um, it's an easy case to make because the Buddha shines. The Buddha just radiates. And you know, <laughs> you know the stories. There's the stories from the Buddha's life where uh, there were, there was a, uh, I'm going to tell my story about how the Buddha is incomparable. You can see my face here. So, um, the Buddha was now awake and walking around in India. And India was a place of 
intense spiritual fervor. Lots and lots of teachers, lots and lots of disciples. Many marga, many paths. You could, there were some that were called Wai Dao, the paths that led outside. You, the, far, the more you go, the more you follow, the farther away you get from your own nature. But there were also really good, really d trustworthy paths that developed your inner resources. So help you cultivate blessings, help you cultivate wisdom. So with all the teachers, of course, jealously guarding their own disciples and their own reputation, when the teachers woke up in the morning and discovered that half of their disciples had gone across the river and sat under that tree because this new awakened one, this new Buddha, was there. They were jealous. They were worried, nervous. They were upset. So there, were, uh, there was one family of brothers who were uh, well, well regarded teachers in one area of India. And the Buddha walked into their ashram. And so the brothers were like, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, remember? Uncle Scrooge McDuck. And so they said, okay, here's what we'll do. In that cave is a ferocious dragon. A real dragon. He's a fire-breathing dragon. Nobody has been able to subdue him at all. And we don't want to be known as jealous. We don't want to be known as uh, anyone who harmed a sage. So we'll just... Uh, here. Uh, welcome, 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 Bhagavan. <laughs> World-honored one. We have prepared for you a very special lodging. We're glad you're here. And... Uh, we have moved out to leave the room safe for you. Over there in that cave is your bed. Uh, there's Wi-Fi, running water. You'll be fine. Uh, please, see you in the morning, nighty-night. And they sent the brand new Buddha into the cave. They omitted the fact that there was a fire-breathing dragon who nobody had been able to tame or subdue. So the Buddha said, oh, well, that's very kind of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your kindness. Ami Tofo. Did he say Ami Tofo? Probably. Ami Tofo. And then the Buddha walked into the cave. And the brothers are like, he, 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 we got him. So that's the last we'll see of him. And we didn't do it. The dragon did. So the next morning, they're all like, Ring the breakfast bell. See if he shows up. Dong, dong. And uh, out comes the Buddha. You know, oh, good. He said, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't offer anything. Uh, what have you got? Uh, I would like to chant for you for, for breakfast. And they're like, what? Uh, um, how did you sleep? <laughs> and, oh, just fine, fine. By the way, um, I'll take half of my food and share it with my new disciple, the dragon in the cave. He took some of his food and went off and fed the And the dragon came out and did the equivalent of wagging the tail, if dragons wag their tails. And the brothers are like, okay, we'll take refuge with you. <laughs> what was your name again? We want to follow you. So that's how praise works when it's real. It's not an idea. It's not a theory. Oh, it'd be a good thing if we took refuge, if we, we should praise this. The bodhisattvas who've come are now forest of wisdom bodhisattva. He sees the Buddha's light. It tames dragons. It's a dragon taming virtue. And dragons are scary and powerful and fire breathing and fatal. And, you know, they'll kill you. They'll burn you up and then swallow you down. And the dragon around the Buddha curls around to protect the Buddha. So it's like, okay, we'll take refuge with you too. Praise the Buddha. Hallelujah. Bodhisattva. True story. Those, are, those stories of the Buddha's life got collected. So, yeah, he's praising the Buddha's beyond compare. There's nobody like him. 
So, indeed. What else does he say? Yet, he says, if you don't understand the Dharma, it's not so much the Buddha, and this is a key point. The Buddha would never say, I want you all to become my disciples. I want you all to uh, adore me. I want you all to express your faith in me. He did not say that. He said, I want you to follow the path. You can walk the path that I walked. It's a walkable path. You can cultivate the way I cultivated. It will take you to the same place it took me if you rufa if you cultivate rufa xing, cultivate according to the Dharma. So once you've torn down the walls of the self, what's left to to defend? What's left to 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 and to uh, praise, right? So we saw the very same thing in the story of Master Xuanzang, the pilgrim, journalist, translator, monk in the Tang Dynasty. He won in India the All Indian National Debate Contest, which was a life and death kind of thing. Uh, if you entered that contest and you out, you were out-debated, you could lose your head if the, the one who won was bloodthirsty or cruel. So one of the perks that came with winning the All India Debate Conference was you got to ride an elephant all around the, uh, the, the field where the competition took place, around the tents where the debates were, were held, with people cheering both sides on. So the king, Srila Ditya, got the elephant, and it was a beautiful, kingly, regal elephant with caparisons, they say, with these huge, you know, golden fabrics draping and a spectacular elephant. And he invited Master Shenzong to take his seat, sitting up so high, higher than any other religious teacher in all of India. And Master Shenzong said, um, no. We actually hold precepts against uh, high, large, tall, large beds. Gao Guang Chuang. So he said, I won't sit there, but I'll take my precept sash. I'll take my robe that I ordained with, and I'll put that on the elephant. And let Everyone see the sash circling around on the elephant. That's Rufa. That's the Dharma. So it's like, oh, you know, right, right. That is worthy of praise. I will bow to that. Um, truly so. Those who fail to grasp the Dharma's truth, the Buddha, they'll never see the Buddha. Not because the Buddha is unhappy with them, because the Buddha is, wants to, you know, punish them, scold them. No, it's because they keep all of their horse blinders. People see horse blinders. We don't. We don't see horses on the street. Back when I was a kid in Toledo, there was the milk truck. We had a local dairy, and the dairy truck was pulled by a horse, and he would. <coughs> on the paved street, and then stop, and he had blinders on, so he wouldn't get distracted by all the interesting things to the left and to the right. And the, uh, the driver, the what is it, teamster of the milk truck, Driggs Dairy in Toledo, D-R-I-G-G-S, Driggs Dairy, um, he loved his horse because he depended on his, it was a team, and he would, Flick, flick, just flick the, the reins and the horse would to the next house and stop. And so horse blinders, the self-seeking, greed, contention, those are the blinders. You can't see the Buddha when the me, the big me in the middle is the most important thing. So 
If you don't grasp the truth of the Dharma, you'll never see the Buddha. That's the praise. How about that? So this is Hui Lin Pusa. His, what he wants us to know is he's kneeling there in front of the Buddha. And what does he say? Fo shan ji shan tong, zi zai nan si yi, wu qu yi wu lai, shuo fa du zhong sheng. The Buddha with his bodies and his psychic powers shows inconceivable sovereign self-mastery. He neither comes nor goes, and he explains the Dharma to save sentient beings. His next quatrain, his next verse, four-line verse, he wants to talk about the Buddha's bodies and his psychic powers. Those are um, clearly unique and wonderful aspects of the Buddha. The Buddha can make three different bodies appear, and he, with his six psychic powers and his five kinds of spiritual vision, wu yan liu tong, san shen wu yan liu tong, he can do things that, that science cannot explain. So this is part of the Bukha Sui, the qualities that the Buddha describes. And the, um, before I met Master Shenhua, uh, this was Buddhist folklore. It was, you know, they talk about it. Who's ever seen psychic powers? Who's ever seen the Buddha's transformed bodies? But Shifu would give us, for example, Guanyin Bodhisattva. And he would say, wow, Guanyin Bodhisattva has the ability to, when the time is right, appear in 32 different forms. Why? The Lotus Sutra tells us about it. And then he would say, actually, frankly, not just 32, it's a limitless number depending on what is needed. Guan Yin Bodhisattva can appear in those different forms. Why? Why would this why would Guan Yin Bodhisattva bother? And the answer is the method of salvation to rescue living beings, as it says, the mes the method of salvation is not compulsion. She doesn't force the situation so that make it, you know, snap your fingers and make it all different. Um, it's because Guan Yin has to inspire us to cultivate our way out of, out of trouble. Um, Rafe Martin, one of the America's best known Buddhist storytellers and storytellers in any tradition. He also, Rafe also has tremendous Native American stories. He tells a story about Guan Yin that is, I've heard it in different combinations of bodhisattvas, but the way Rafe Martin teaches is, it's a story about Guan Yin Bodhisattva um, being challenged by somebody. Somebody says, hmm, you, you talk about rescuing living beings, but we've heard about the hells. If you were really compassionate, why don't you just stop the hells? If you've got all that much power, the hells are supposed to be awful. People are suffering. There's all affliction and ignorance and zero wisdom down in the hells. The Buddha is the opposite. He's all wisdom and no ignorance. His coverings of ignorance are gone. So how do you call this compassion if you know the suffering in the hells is awful and you let it continue? Come on. It's not compassion. And Guan Yin Bodhisattva responds and says, you really don't understand the nature of living beings. Where do you think the hells come from? He says, I'll show you, All right? So Guan Yin Bodhisattva takes the person over to the gates of the hells and makes a sound, goes snap, and the suffering ends. The cries cease. That feeling of despair, abandoned hope, 
O ye who enter, has gone, and the smoke clears, and the smells, you know what the, hell, the hells smell like? And it all stops. And they hear a drip, plush, off a brick down into the water. And the person who's challenging Guan Yin's eyes get bigger. But then, in a matter of 30 seconds, there's a scream, followed by a shout, followed by a puff of black smoke, followed by a stench rising, and then a chorus of cries and screams and wails. And the person says, what? What's going on? Guanyin Bodhisattva says, it's the nature of living beings. We can't stop ourselves from making the karma that takes us to the hells. I can stop it, but the ongoing karma of living beings is such that we recreate the hells in thought after thought. You really don't understand the nature of living beings. So we save the ones we can. We inspire them to cultivate. Then it's real taking across, real salvation. So it's like, yeah, that's the story that Rafe Martin tells. So the uh, here's our Bodhisattva. What did it say? He said he explains the Dharma to save living beings. So Guanyin Bodhisattva appears in all these different forms to save us as we can be saved by somebody we believe uh, in order to accept what somebody says you have to trust them they have to convince you persuade you inspire you uh, amuse you so that you are willing to accept and then overcome your own habits to pick, on, pick up a better way of being, how hard it is. And that's why it can't be sudden. It's not quick. Uh, so Guanyin Bodhisattva has all these incredible bodies. And then the psychic power part, this is, this is key, I think. In, in the West, psychic powers, um, my understanding of psychic powers growing up was somewhere in Toledo, uh, maybe down in East Toledo, the Maumee River, or maybe along the Maumee River, or maybe in Perrysburg or Swanton, one of the little communities on the borders, the outskirts of Toledo, there would be a little cottage with a neon sign that said, Madam Olga, fortune teller. <laughs> or if you were really, if you, if you, had the connections, you would wait for the gypsies to come through, the Ram. And uh, they, you had to be there to see them because they come with the dust and they go with the wind. And there were uh, Romani people who would tell fortunes. But psychic powers were that. It was on the outskirts. It was something you didn't take seriously is the kind of the same way that newspaper astrology was considered just a bogus entertainment kind of a pastime but you didn't invest in it you didn't depend on it or count on it you didn't make decisions um, so that was what i think many people assume that psychic powers because they're not scientific and they can't be tested, so they don't exist. They're not real. They're beneath our, our serious consideration. And yet, when you get to the sutras, and the sutras uh, describe bodhisattvas who, because of their compassion, and this is the key point, this is the turning point that makes it different. Bodhisattvas are beings who know enough to 
transform their own delusion. They, their wisdom grows through their cultivation. They change their habits to nurture their own wisdom instead of obstruct their own wisdom. They don't harm others. They don't harm themselves. They, don't, they change their speech habits. They tell the truth. They speak kindly, gently, softly. They, so body, no harm. Service instead. Mouth, no harm. Gentle, persuasive speech. And the mind, they don't allow their mind to dwell on doubt, on negativity, on fears, on anger. They treat their minds like they would treat a brand new child, protecting it, guarding it, shielding it, because the mind is the source of all goodness when it's nurtured and fertilized and moistened and, and uh, the sun of wisdom shines on it and the Bodhi resolve, those flowers grow. That's what Bodhisattvas do. And as a result, they're in the world and they protect themselves and while they're in the world, what they see is people are hurting. There's just lots and lots of hurt going on out there. Lots of pain, lots of just pointless, pointless destruction. Imagine if you were in an apartment block and a missile came tearing through your ceiling. And all the things that you care about. You, you were preparing dinner for your family. And the, the roast was in the oven. Or the, you know, the veggie burgers were, were uh, on the counter. And suddenly there's no counter. Your kitchen's been destroyed. And your child is now bleeding on the floor. And your mother is dead in her chair. Because why? Because some ignorant human being decided it was important to go to war. Right? A lot of suffering. Bodhisattvas see that. They see all of it. They see people dying of cancer. They see people, uh, companies creating conditions that increase cancer, knowing that it's going to, to harm people, and they do it. There's, uh, they put a pipeline through the aquifer of a city. So, the, And what do they do? They think, hmm. How can I wake these folks up? How can I get them to stop hurting themselves and others? I'm determined I'm going to do that. I'm going to find a way to explain to them how this behavior makes things better and that behavior makes things worse. And because, and this is key, because we are stubborn and we cling to our ideas really strongly, Bodhisattvas have to come up with a little bit of something extra to teach. And psychic powers emerge out of the compassion. So the Bodhisattvas see the suffering. They can't stand to see us, people they know they're related to. They're the same as, right? Tong ti, same body. And yet some of us just keep on hurting ourselves. And so they need something extra. So what do they get? They get mm, tian yan tong. They get the ability to see beyond this mundane world with the eyes, the deva eyes, with the celestial vision. They get tian er tong, the ability to hear beyond what ordinary, the spectrum of sound that ordinary humans can hear. They get ta xin tong. They get the ability to know clearly, as it really is, who we were in the past, who they were and who we are. So they can see tendencies. They can see how we ascend and then fall and ascend and fall. And they're determined to pull us out. They get xu ming tong. Uh, they, I said that was, that was, gave the wrong Chinese. The xu ming tong is the past lives. They get the ta xing tong, the ability to know what's on our mind. What are we thinking? And oh my, if you know what your dad is thinking, you can avoid the things that trigger his anger and buttons and, and stubbornness, and you say things that instead give him 
uh, a new perspective that widen his ability to see. And, and yeah, it's a good, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it, says your dad, because you know what he's thinking. And then they have two more. One of them is that that uh, bodhisattvas don't have, and it's called the lo jin tong, the ending of all outflows. That's what Buddha said. But they have this this number five, which is called shen tong, the ability to transform your body. And uh, you can do all kinds of miraculous things with that particular ability. Now, where do these come from? They're sparked by the compassion. They arise from the compassion. Without the compassion, there's no Buddhist shantong. There can be other kinds of spiritual abilities. Key, why? Those capacities are in us, according to the sutras and according to the, the men and women who have manifested those spiritual powers in the past. Those abilities are all innate. They're hardwired in there, but we don't create the conditions to embody those, those qualities. So the people hear about the powers and they trigger their greed. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I knew, if I could know what he's thinking, or if I could see the future also, if I had past lives, future lives, I could know which horse to pick at the horse track. You know, I could go to Las Vegas and kill on blackjack and roulette and just, they don't change anything about worldly greed and anger and delusion, but they simply add on to it more desire. In this case, it's special desire. I want psychic powers, but I'm just the same old unclear glass, you know, smudged window, won't let multicolored light in. Uh, it's just, you don't change the color of the light if your window is smudged, it's the same murky result. So what the Bodhisattva does is he polishes the window glass and then gets rid of the glass, which is the self, and psychic powers arise spontaneously because they can, with them, they can help living beings. So that's from the Buddhist point of view. Now that's uh, a principle, and according to Shurfu's teachings, Master Hua, he would say there's many, many different stories in the Dharma realm. <laughs> this is Naked City. This is one story out of hundreds. So in, for example, dragons, the Master Hua would say that dragons in their dragon bodies, animals in the realm of animals, can still attain psychic powers, but because they don't have the virtue or the compassion, they can't use them the way a bodhisattva does. Demons, he would say, that Mara, Satan, has some of those psychic powers. They don't have the equivalent of the Buddha's powers, but they can use them to entice us towards harm. So it's like, whoa, this is deep. So um, when you hear that people advertise we uh, have one amazing story that I've told before. There was a well-known Canadian author named Feng Feng. Uh, he was originally Taiwanese, and when he was in Taiwan, he was quite a remarkable young man, uh, considered having a great promise. And he was quite a writer and journalist, and, and uh, he immigrated to Canada, and that's where his paths crossed with Master Xuanhua and Go Buddha Monastery in Vancouver. And Feng Feng started a newspaper, and the newspaper was called Tianhua, Flowers of, of Heaven. And in the newspaper, he let it be known that he had Tian Yin Tong. He could see into the heavens. And his, he advertised himself saying, you know, I, I know what's going on with you because I can see it. So Master Hua said, Peter Fong, Feng Feng, he had a Western name as well, said, Peter, do not, do not tell people that you have Tian Yan, the Deva's eye, Deva's vision. Even if you do, you cannot tell people. And if you don't, even more you can't tell people. Don't 
advertise for yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. So Feng Feng said, okay, Shifu, ha, 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 okay. He said, but people need me. So, so Master Hua shook his head. And uh, that was our first meeting up in, in Vancouver. And actually, at that point, when, when we first met Feng Feng, uh, we had Wu Da Zong Shi, five principles of City of 10,000 Buddhas that Shifu, uh, the five great principles that Shifu used and taught with for so long. And then after Feng Feng, he added one more, Bu Da Wang Yu, don't lie, don't tell lies. And he said, that's, that's for Feng Feng, is that last one. So fundamental teachings of how to cultivate the way. Okay, so Feng Feng, a uh, number of months later, came down to City of 10,000 Buddhas. And uh, I remember one day, uh, he, we were, he and I were walking in the Tathagata Monastery, and he said, oh, 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 we must, oh, there's a turtle. Somebody's in trouble, quick. And so he went running out of the monastery, and I was following after him. And he, uh, he, he was following something he was seeing, and we found, he went running over, and he found a turtle flipped over on his back. And he said, this turtle was calling me. So we flipped the turtle back. And so there was something different about him. He was special in a number of ways, as a good writer as well, but... Uh, as a layman, he wasn't a monk, he was just a layman. And uh, so, uh, I helped uh, put uh, Feng Feng together with, with Shifu again, and uh, just, I was uh, I set up the appointment. And so, uh, Shifu said one more time, he said, Feng Feng, you really need to to stop advertising your shantong. He said, your tianyan is not going to help you. He said, you, you think you're helping, but in fact, he said, you don't know the, how it's heard, how it's being received by the people who read your, your magazine, your tianhua. Your little, it's a periodical. And so Feng Feng said, okay, sure, okay, okay. Well, he went back to Vancouver, and within a few months, an edition of Tianhua came out, and it said in it, said Feng Feng, he said, um, I need to tell everyone that my, my Tianyan has closed. I can't see anymore the things I said. So please stop sending your requests, he said. Now what had happened was the word got out that Feng Feng could see things that Yu Zhong Botong was different from ordinary people, and the requests started coming in. And this is long before the internet. So people would mail in. They would say, my grandmother has got a problem, and this, this has been with her for 20 years. Could you please come up with a way to solve my grandmother's pain? And Feng Feng would, oh, what can I possibly say, you know? And then a letter would come in and say, my daughter uh, fell off a boat in the harbor and drowned. Where is she gone? Please tell us where she is. My heart is broken. I need to know that my daughter is fine. And Feng Wong was like, oh, what do I? And mail bags full of letters, requests for him to use his tianyan to his deva ai to, to save living beings and to, to end people's suffering. And you know, Feng Feng's impulse was very wholesome. He wanted to help, but he didn't take Shifu's advice, and he advertised that he could, but he didn't have the fa li, the strength in the Dharma. He didn't have the the Shantong supporting, the, other than this one psychic ability. So, after I was told, and and Feng Feng passed away uh, a while later. And uh, we met some friends, some Dharma friends from Vancouver, who said, you know, people still write. They, they get a copy of the, the, the periodical, and they think, oh, I'll try this, because nothing else works. Medical science can't help, so maybe Feng Feng with his tianyin. And they, they don't know he's actually 
gone off to to the Pure Land. So bodhisattvas don't advertise. You know what they say: Zhen ren bu lou xiang, lou xiang fei zhen ren. The ones who are true don't let you know. If they let you know, they're not real. So when you hear people advertising that they can tell you your past lives and know what you're thinking and they have clairvoyance and clear audience and such, be very cautious. It's not for sure. Uh, and even if they do know, you still have to cultivate your own precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. So, yeah. So here's the bodhisattva who says, now the Buddha is another story. Look at the Buddha. He says, the Buddha has bodies and psychic powers, powers with inconceivable sovereign self-mastery. What is that? It's zi zai. Now this word, here it is in Chinese. Zi zai, nan si yi. Here it is. Self-present, difficult to conceive of, to think about. So sovereign self-mastery, this in, in Sanskrit, it's called Ishvara. And this concept is really tantalizing for translators. We haven't got a good translation of Zidzai because it is an inconceivable state. Um, in uh, Ishvara, in Hinduism, for thousands of years, Hindus in the Hindu world, they've been debating what is Tzidzai, uh, Ishvara. And there's a deva, Ta Tzidzai Tian, who is, uh, he is Maheshvara, and he is the, uh, it's great Tzidzai. He's a deva who Master Hua would, would talk about uh, in the heavens riding on a, a bull, a white bull, and very, he would say, very free and easy. He's right in between the desire realm and the form realm, and he can come and go in both realms. He's a deva, he's a god, he is a hufa, a dharma protector, but how do we translate that? Comfort? No. Freedom? Not really. Free and easy? We've heard that before. So we, the as Shervu described it, if you are zizai, you are in charge of your own happiness, suffering, where you came from, where you're going, your rebirths, the things that happen to you, you are tzitzai. You are free of any further, any other constraint. And there is a, an image of Guanyin Bodhisattva who is Guan Zizai Pusa. Uh, so the Bodhisattva who we say contemplates at ease, Guan Zizai, she contemplates this state of being totally self-determining. You've got no power that pushes you in any direction. You're in charge. Sovereign self-mastery. That's our best translation to date. So um, here's our Bodhisattva who says, yes, indeed, the Buddha is Tzudzai and has, hold on, I'm going to get you there. The Buddha has inconceivable self-mastery. And with his Dharma body being the same as everything, it doesn't come, it doesn't go. But what he does is he explains the Dharma to save sentient beings. <laughs> One more. Ruyo de Jen Wan Ching Jing Tian Ren Shi Yong Shu Zhu O Chi Shu Li Yi Che Ku Those who get to see and hear the pure teacher of devas and humans will leave behind pathways of distress forever. All suffering is over for them. If you get to hear and see the Buddha, this pure teacher of devas, teacher of Maheshvara, ah, 
teacher of all kinds of humans, such a person will leave suffering forever. All distress, all pain, all misery, the blues, it's over for such a person when you get to hear and really see the Buddha. Um, at this point, I'll park you down there. I'm going to bring up uh, our Berkeley Monastery songbook. Hey, hey, look at that. Hope everybody can see that. Um, there we go. Get all five, one, two, three, five verses in there. Um, every year at Buddha's birthday, we have certain songs that we sing and certain praises. And this takes me to the, the theme that I introduced at the start of our lecture, which is people don't think that people outside the, the monastic tradition don't think of Buddhism as being uh, devotional. They think it's Chan or mindfulness or Vipassana uh, or secret mantras, secret school. Rarely do people think that there's anyone to praise. We praise this when you have a God up in heaven. So, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Right? Sing that every Sunday, the doxology. So that's a praise tradition with a deva, with a God, with a a supreme being, the Heavenly Father. Who would think that here, here we have 10 bodhisattvas, each in turn singing 10 hymns of praise, 10 doxologies from each bodhisattva praising the Buddha. But here it is. She was a lot to learn, isn't it? More than simply Chan. And anybody, any Zen sitter who somehow misreads Dogen and thinks that all you have to do is sit on your cushion and rehearse your koan, mm, there's value there. It's not the whole story. There's so much more. And that gets kind of dry after 33,000 hours on your zafu. Right? So let's look at the tradition, the way it comes down to us. And every year on the full moon of the fourth or fifth lunar month, we praise the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, and then on Amitabha's birthday, we have Amitabha praise, Medicine Buddha, Medicine Buddha's praise, Guanyin, Guanyin praise, Urstor, Urstor praise. Lots of praises. And the uh, on the Buddha on the, the Buddha's bathing the Buddha day, Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday, there's uh, this wonderful verse that we do: Tian Shang, Tian Sha, Wu Ru Fu, Shi Fang, Shi Jie, Yi Wu Bi, Shi Jian, Suo Yo, Wu Jin Jian, Yi Che Wu Yo, Ru Fu Jie. Upon the earth. Below the sky, the Buddha has no peer. In ten directions everywhere, he is beyond compare. And then the last half of that, I've searched around this whole wide world. Now I can declare you'll never find a wiser one than Buddha anywhere. Wiser, key word. We're comparing wisdom. And the Buddha wins. Okay, so um, I thought... Well, wow, that's such a good praise. Let's put it into English. But then it's too short. We need to add some verses. So I added, these are my creation for this. He's gone beyond duality. The Buddha's not stuck in duality anymore. He's never born again. The Buddha had his last birthday. With wisdom bright, he blesses me. And with his compassion, he knows my joy and my pain. The Buddha was a human life after life, he totally understands our situation. He walked the noble middle way. That's the, some people will say, the, the high point of the Buddha, of the Dharma, is the fact that it avoids extremes, it keeps us in the middle. With strength and purity, in dark of night, in light of day, it's his kindness that touches me the most. 
He's not divine, but he's awake. And I've told this story so many times, probably I don't have to tell it again. You're going to go, oh, here comes that story again. So which one is it? It's the other Brahman. We talked about the Buddha in the cave with the dragon, taming the dragon. But uh, the, uh, there was a, a Brahman who saw the Buddha walking with his numerous disciples behind him, and he thought, I will out-debate this fake. I'm going to... I'm going to beat him in debate. So he confronted the Buddha in front of the in front of the row of all the monks behind. He says, ha, he says, are you a god? He starts out with his challenge. And the Buddha says, no, no, I'm really not a god. Oh, so deflects the, the attack. And the Brahmin's a little nettled. And he says, hmm, well, I was, I was, are you a demon then? And the Buddha smiles, no, I'm not a demon. And oh, now the Brahmin's got to dig deeper. He says, well, are you an avatar? What do you represent? And the Buddha says, no, I'm not an avatar. I don't represent anything. And now the Brahmin's all upset. Well, uh, what are you? The Buddha says, I'm awake. The Brahmin puts his palms together and goes to the end of the line and follows the Buddha. So he's not divine, but he's awake. He's neither come nor gone, as our verse just now said in the sutra. I find him in each blade of grass. He is the wisdom son. In his dharma body, he's completely made of virtue and light. He's the wisdom son. Blazes like a thousand suns. So there's our English language praise of the Buddha. Wiser one, Buddha.
the anywhere you'll never find a wiser than Buddha anywhere. So that's our English language. Praise of the Buddha, and we shouldn't have to wait until Buddha's birthday to sing that praise. We should sing it more often. Why not? Uh, we'll do one more verse. Here we go. Coming up. Here we are. Royal de Jian Wan, Qing Jing, Tian Ren Shi. Yong Chu Zhu O Chu Shuli Yi Che Ku. Those who get to see and hear the pure teacher of devas and humans will leave behind pathways of distress forever. All suffering is over for them. Okay, we sang that just before. Um, if you get to hear, your suffering is left behind. Now, How does that work? There are a lot of people who are defended against religion. Um, they maybe live in a country where Buddhism has been for centuries and it gets mixed with uh, what's called Minjian Xinyang, with folk belief and layers of superstition. People Pick, cherry pick a piece of the religion or that piece of the religion and, and miss the principles. And then somebody in their community distorts it and gets a, goes on a power trip and owns that cherry pick story. And, you know, and it just, it's no longer the Dharma. It's now uh, been diluted. And so those kinds of, that kind of happens to every religion. Or you get somebody who's downright evil, who uses the religion to harm. The Spanish Inquisition comes to mind. And the hundreds of thousands of people who died uh, at the hands of men who distorted the teaching to their own benefit didn't have anything to do with the teachings of Jesus. So, um, does that sound familiar? Supreme Courts who become zealous we won't go there today, but so how do you bring people faith in the right Dharma? My, um, when I, I was at one point a zealous proselytizer of vegetarian diet, I wanted people to eat plant-based foods and I would preach, uh, especially when I had teenagers or preteens, I would tell them stories and the kids would go home to their mom after my lecture and say, mom, I'm going to stop eating meat. And the mother would say, who told you that? You're going to eat in my kitchen, whatever I fix. And your father likes meat and I'm not going to cook too, you know, then they would come looking for me and say, you, what are you doing brainwashing my child? That's not fair. I'm not going to, I don't want you to talk anymore to my kids. I'm pulling my kid out of Sunday school. So I realized, wow, you know, we don't live in the vacuum. And it even it, you need to be responsible for the things you say, the results of the things you say. So I got a little wiser in the way I presented something I believe strongly in, that the world would be a better place if we nourished our bodies in something other than dead flesh from sentient creatures. So, what I learned was the best way to make, to give people a sense that being a plant-based, eating a plant-based diet was wholesome, the best way to do it was to give them something to eat that tasted as good as what I was suggesting they might consider giving up. Much better to show than to tell. All right. So, how do you make a Buddhist? 
How do people become Buddhists? This is a uh, question I've been asking for a couple weeks now. And I'm getting answers back in both of my lectures. My lecture in the Song of Enlightenment community and our Avatamsaka community. We're asking people both on the Chinese side and the English language side. What helped you come closer to the Dharma? What do you remember was your experience that brought you closer? And I'm going to share a story that's like giving people, putting something on people's tongue that tastes as good, but doesn't involve killing karma or suffering. Uh, the taste as good as the meat they're giving up. We had, we have now in our Berkeley monastery community, a group called the Zhu Nian Tuan, the uh, Buddha recitation group. And it's completely volunteers, good-hearted lay people, who are willing to, when requested, and the conditions are right, they go out to people's bedsides and recite the Buddha's name um, as they are passing away. And ideally, if they can get there before they pass away, they, they teach people, they share with people how to nianfu. This is based on the Pure Land teachings of, about the Buddha Amitabha. And our group has been going for years. In fact, we were inspired by Gold Mountain Monasteries, Zhu Nian Tuan. They would go out to members of the community when requested. And now, this is not an original idea, but the way we do it is original. Um, the, in, the, in the Chinese community, it's known that at the end of life you call the Buddhists. Uh, not for weddings, not so much for babies, christenings, you take refuge, but at the end of life is when you want the Buddhist to come. And some unscrupulous monks and nuns turn this into an income. And they would, they were known for gan jing chan. They would call hustle sutras and repentances for money. Uh, they would, you know, they if you called them, there was a price list. Bup, bup, bup. This will cost you this much. If you want that, it costs more. If you want this, how many monks? How many sutras? How many repentance? It'll cost you. So uh, Master Hua said, number one, we don't go out. DRBA monks and nuns, we don't go out to sing for you. We Monks, as the Dharma gets going in outside of Asia, in North America, here in Australia, in Canada, wherever it is, Europe, um, we're not going to make our living by hustling sutras and repentances. That's, that's not cultivation. That's business, doing business. So is that discompassionate? Because people do pass on. So what do you do? He said, well, come into the monastery. If you can come into the monastery, we'll be happy to do Buddhist-inspired, Buddhist-themed uh, funeral services for people in the community, people with whom we have affinities. We'll put up a plaque, but you come in and you light incense and bow before the plaque of your ancestor. Uh, we will do the ceremony, but then keeping it going is up to you. We're not on contract from you as a customer that you buy our services. It's not the way we're going to do it. So we made that, that point. And yet, there are people who are too weak to come to the monastery or who know their end is coming. They might be in hospice. And so the monks not going out created this opportunity for our laity, laity, our lay people, devoted volunteers who just love to recite the Buddha's name and who, by the way, are rescuing living beings, teaching, crossing beings over. So uh, a few years back, there was... Uh, an elderly uh, laywoman. I, I'll, I'll call her Mrs. Yen, but I, that's not her name. And she was a grandma and just so kind-hearted and devoted. She herself was a Buddhist. And she would come into the monastery with, and she was very elderly. She was in her ninth, ninth decade. And uh, she would come in the monastery with her, her walker and, and sit in the back and just look at the Buddha and recite and just was so happy that we, the monks would come in and, 
and say hello to her, and she would slowly get up and bow. We'd say, no need to bow. And she would bow, and then she'd go home. And the our lay community really liked old Mrs. Yen. She was very sweet and just so sincere, you know. So her time came, and she was going to pass away. And uh, so our Jun Yen Tuan, our Buddha reciting group, uh, went to her home, and there were all of her family called in from uh, Taiwan and New York and L.A. and and everywhere, and the uh, she was so happy to see our group, but the children were not. There were children there who thought, "Oh man, here come the monks! Watch your credit card, grab your wallet, because this is going to cost us." They were suspicious and and you know not to say hostile, but almost because they the Buddhism that they knew back home was, you could say, corrupt. It was a cash on the counter business. And so our lay people went in and they wanted nothing to do with money. This is not for money. And they were no nonsense. They sat around the bed and they were they went, Namo Amitofo Namo Amitofo Namo Amitofo, Namo Amitofo. And they did it with a single mind. Not looking left, not looking right, not Pan Yuan climbing on conditions. They were focused on Mrs. Yen. And through their sincerity, you got a feeling that they were focused on something else like Amitabha. It was bigger than them, and it for and through their eyes and through their sound, there was something genuine in their behavior. And so they recited, and then they came back a second day on their own after work, and they came back a third day, and those who weren't working would come during the day and recite. And the family, and Mrs. Yen uh, didn't, didn't die right away. She took took a while, uh, and she herself was just glowing. She was so serene, facing her death. And for the, for the week that it took her to pass away from the time that our group first, lent, first went, there was a huge transformation in the family because they saw and they heard the sincerity of these volunteers who, when they were done, they would recite for an hour or two, they would take turns, and they were kind, they were pleasant, they were uh, obviously accomplished professional people, a couple PhDs, and, and yet they just were there to help and to recite because they loved it, and they really felt this goodness from old Mrs. Yen. So when the the elder finally passed away. She had a smile on her face. There was a, an energy of uh, completion and closure and gentleness, and her body was soft. Didn't, there was no rigor mortis and obviously no fear. And by the time uh, she, she finally passed away, a week after they started going, um, the whole family was reciting along, and they would have this yeah, the ceremony book, and they would ami tofu, and they were so moved by watching their mother or grandmother uh, be grateful to the lay people who were there reciting simply for the goodness of it, for the practice, that they dropped all of their. Uh, that hostility and that doubts and the suspicion and the antagonism. And they picked up the practice themselves and started to recite for their mom. And after uh, her death was so peaceful and so uh, gentle that they came 
to the monastery afterwards and said, we we really want to give, we want to donate, we want to give because uh, we thank you. And we wanted to give the money to the lay people, but they wouldn't accept it. They said, no, no, this, no we don't accept money. And, and so we want to, where can we give it? So we said, here, put it in the box. This is fine, you know. And they came back. And so our lay community, the Junyan Tuan, the Buddha recitation group, simply because they believe in Amitabha and they want to help people who uh, help them, uh, who, who cult, their fellow cultivators, who believe in the Pure Land and who make this story their own story, um, they were able to cross over the family. So like, if you want to make, if you want to have somebody change their diet from flesh to plant-based, give them something that tastes as good as what they're giving up, but doesn't involve any harm or hatred. That's the way you make a plant-based eater. You show them, not tell them. Same thing goes true. It's true for for people who you want to bring in to the Dharma. In this case, our Jun Yin Tuan uh, completely pierced through that shell of mistrust and uh, aversion to what they knew back home as Buddhism. And then they finally met the real Dharma, the actual practice of cultivation of the Pure Land. So yes, indeed, Buddhism does have uh, we do have our devotional tradition, and it's a good one. Um, got another song for you. We'll continue. Uh, Forest of Wisdom has three more verses that we'll, we'll share with you next week. We'll finish, and then we'll do one of the next Bodhisattva. Um, I've got another devotional song. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, you know what? Um, I, yeah, we need to, uh, I'm going to run out of time here. I want to keep everybody focused on seven Tathagata's names, which include Amitabha. This is our, this practice began with this, uh, this lecture series. take refuge in the names of the seven Tathagatas. Namo do bao ru lai, namo bao shen ru lai, namo mo shai shen ru lai, namo guang go shen ru lai, namo li bu re ru lai, namo gan lu wang ru lai, namo I got a question for you all. Um, what what was it that 
got you to believe, to say, I want to know more. I want to hear the Dharma. What was it? Do you remember? Anybody have a fresh memory? Or was it one thing? Or was it gradual, a collection of things? Um, see these men? Some are, the, the front row are the elders. Back row are the youngers in their 20s then, who now are the, the monks in charge. They saw something that made that increased their belief in the Dharma. And it has to do with this photograph. Hope everybody can see that photo. What is going on? You see Master Shrenhua holding many strands of beads, recitation beads, and they're nice beads. And he's kneeling. And you see in the front is a precept robe. So there's a monk here. And what is happening? This photo was taken at the end of the Water, Land, and Air Soul Mass in 1987 at City of 10,000 Buddhas when 100 monks, nuns, and lay people came from China in a historic moment for Buddhism in the 20th century because this is the first time since 1949 that monks or nuns had left China. And they, the waterland was a success. And as the monks were leaving to go to the airport, they were going to fly down to Los Angeles, um, they had to go through uh, a, a hallway to get out to where they were departing. And they found Master Hua kneeling, handing each of them a string of beads as they went out with a smile, not a word, just a smile and a gift from his knees. And I saw a, a documentary film made about the water, land, and air by the Chinese and released in China as just a documentary story about what had happened. And when it came to this, this particular scene, I remember the very even baritone voiced narrator of the documentary got emotional. And he said, look at this. This is the host. This is our Zhang Lao. This is our, our Fa, Fa Zhu. This is our Dharma host. This is the Lü Mei Gao Sheng, Master Shrenhua, the distinguished monk that went to America on his knees, Gong Song, sending us away. He said everyone had tears. So I've heard monks talk about it still to this day, that they couldn't believe that that Shifu would humble himself in front of his guests this way and they have never forgotten it. So here's a story of um, monks who have already left home, committed to decades in robes, and yet their faith in the Dharma is still being inspired by things that, that they see. So all the way up until you actually see the Buddha, and then, ooh, with that light shining on your nature, there's no more doubts, no more fears, for sure. So let's all keep working until we see the Buddha ourselves with our own eyes. Meanwhile, we see the Buddha nature in our good and wise advisors. Okay, uh, I'm going now to invite... Ma, Berkeley Mon asked Terry, the monks of the Berkeley Monastery to tell us what's going on. And hold on here. They, uh, I don't know if there's anybody there to do that. Are they on their way down to L.A. at the moment? Mm -hmm. are there. Oh, there. you're here. Yay. All right. Here, here we go. Okay. Hold on. Let me bring this up. Then. Ah. There we go. Okay, can you see the website? Is it there? 
Yes, so Dharma Sir, we have a few announcements. Hey, please do. At 6.30 a.m. California time, we have our monthly uh, transference of dedication of merits from the Great Compassion Mantra recitation, monthly recitation. So we will recite 21 times uh, Great Compassion Mantra and share some reflections and transfer merit. Uh, we also, you Dharma mentioned about we have a short trip. So it means that we will cancel on Sunday evening ceremony and then you scroll down, Dharma Master, for that. Scroll down. Yeah, here, the cancel. Yeah, yeah what well, is cancel? So postpone. Yeah. Sunday evening ceremony and a Monday morning and evening ceremony. And we'll back on Tuesday again to our daily streaming of the ceremonies. And, okay. And you're you're on a road trip. You have to go uh, down to LA and you'll be back. Yeah. Drive and safely, mindfully. Yeah. Can you can move uh, move up a little bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, our uh, once a year, we have this special event, this interfaith blood drive, when we together with our friends from the spiritual communities at Berkeley, from uh, Con Congregation Native of Shalom, this is the Hebrew tradition, from the Pacifica Institute and Women's Mask from Muslims, Muslim tradition, uh, Christians the Way and the Vedanta Society, along with us, we show up together and we donate blood. And this small gesture that uh, means a lot for those who need. Uh, and it's every two seconds in the US someone needs blood. One donation can save up to three lives. So it's an uh, important uh, opportunity and good opportunity to cultivate our generosity, our dana practice. Mm -hmm. It's very safe, you know, that the uh, blood drive is run by Red Cross and they follow all these high standards of safety and infections uh, and, uh, control. And of course, COVID protocols. So there will be six feet uh, distance and everyone will be masked and People can find more information on, on this uh, here, links and, 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 and the Red Cross website. So I highly recommend it to sign up as fast as possible. We have not so many slots uh, available and it will be Wednesday, August 17th from 12 uh, p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, and I want to emphasize this point. This is an interfaith blood drive. We've done this, what is it now, five years or six years now? Yeah, probably five, six years, yeah. And the uh, it's held at the uh, the synagogue. So Netivot Shalom, Jewish friends, but it's co-sponsored by Muslims, Hindus from Vedanta Society, and we Buddhists. And it's a wonderful interfaith moment when you realize under the skin the blood is all red <laughs> and uh, yeah. i wanted yeah. to point out that here in australia as of last week europeans can now donate blood Ooh. so Wei Shi, the uh mad cow uh taboo yep. has been lifted here is, in Australia. Oh, really? Oh, so I can even, yeah. I can also donate in America. I have an opportunity a year ago. You live out That's for great. For, so, for years, so. they wouldn't accept blood from anybody from continental Europe for fear that somehow their blood had been tainted by, uh, by the mad cow disease. Yeah. And that, that fear, plus the need for blood, has now uh abated so it's like okay we can now take your blood <laughs> yes you have to change it's 12 uh, p.m not a.m this is not uh, not night night drive no, no, no. okay 12 a.m 12 p.m that's right noon to six yeah and i think uh you're also accepting volunteers to staff is that right yes we have a few people who sign up and will help out on the front desk and yeah it's very joyful wonderful 
opportunity to make blood. And what was uh, very kind of touching for my kind of personal personal experience, those people who waiting for their uh, time to go and donate blood, actually our Jewish friends opened their shrine hall. So I was sitting, you know, in this kind of prayer hall, waiting mm -hmm. for my turn. It was quite touching, kind of connecting to their spirituality, their lineage, right. and prepare myself to be blood. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's, I've I've never been in there. I haven't seen that. I, that's maybe next time I'll get a chance to to go into the the holy of holies for the for the Jewish religion. Yeah, in there with the Torah. Great. Okay. Anything more? Keep scrolling down. Just Keep going. I think this is just a, maybe what we normally do during the week. So we're going to share lectures, Song of Enlightenment on Fridays, 1 to 2 p.m. And below you have the afternoon Amitabha recitation on all the other uh, afternoons, Sunday to Thursday, Saturday to Thursday, 12.30 to 1. Okay. And if you want to meditate, you can also do that on Thursdays and Fridays. Yep. In person. In person. Great. Okay. Well, safe journey down south. And uh, look forward to, um, if, if it's possible to say hello uh, through, you know, tomorrow through the connection, then let's try. You can connect me through. All right. Okay. Yes, we will do. Oh, for sure. Okay. If if it doesn't work, that's okay too. Um, so, what time do you think that is likely to be? Probably be sometime between three to five p.m. California Perfect. time. That's great. We will we will text you um, on the way. On the way. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Well, we're going to transfer the merit now for today's lecture, and next week we'll be back with the final verses of. Hui Lin Pusa, the forest of, of wisdom, and uh, more stories about how people became Buddhist. What was that first inspiration or the continuing inspiration? We saw Shurfu on his knees passing out beads and inspiring these old crusty monks who were brought to tears by the humility of our teachers. So, yes, indeed. All right, and COVID continues to to transmute and morph into new infected forms. Our president, President Biden, has now tested positive for the second time, but is displaying no symptoms um, and is in quarantine, but is still able to work. So you think of all of the protections in the White House and around uh, the head of state, and he still runs into the COVID virus twice. So. How serious is this virus still going? Um, so let's learn and practice our Mahayana protection mantra, courtesy of Medicine Buddha. And at the same time, transfer merit for today's lecture. Last time, Om Namo Bhagavate.
ते And we will conclude with an opportunity to bow to the Buddha and also to our founder. Three bows to the Buddha. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. All right, that's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Keep reciting Medicine Buddha's Mantra. Stay safe. Amitofu. Bye, everybody.